Hello, welcome to the Nathan Hale Homestead. My name is Bev and I am the site administrator here. This is where Nathan Hale was born and raised and he lived in a very small house that was on the property from the 1750s. The house behind me was where his family lived. His mother, Elizabeth Hale, had uh, 12 children um, with her husband, Deacon Hale. Um, in 1775, Nathan Hale actually became captain of an army for the Revolutionary War. And in 1776, uh, Nathan Hale was hanged by the British as a spy. Nathan Hale is uh, most known for his famous last words right before he was hung, and those words were... I only regret that I have but one life to lose for this country. Elizabeth, the mother, died after her 12th child in the house. Which left Deacon Richard Hale um, able to remarry a widow by the name of Abigail Adams. She had seven children of her own. The family combined made up of 19 children. They needed a larger farmhouse, so back in 1776, they wound up building this house here, so this way it can encompass their larger family. Of the eight sons, six of them fought in the American Revolution. Nathan is killed as a spy. Um, and then the, there are three more that their lives were greatly affected by the war. The oldest son came back, and he's described as infirm. But he wasn't able to run the farm, he wasn't able to do much work, never married, had a family. So we wonder if perhaps he was affected as, today we would have stress disorder or shell shock. Um, but for whatever reason, the oldest son, he lived a long time, but he didn't really um, contribute much to the farm. Two other of the sons came back and they had evidently been on British prison ships. And when they returned to Coventry, they died of disease, leaving their young families. So um, the Hales, Richard and Abigail, actually raised a number of their grandchildren because the sons had died um, due to the American Revolution. Deacon Hale lived here at the house until about 1802 when he died. After he died for a few decades, uh, generations of the Hale family lived and occupied the house after that. In 1914, the house and property was acquired by George Dudley Seymour, who uh, restored the house because the house was left in ruins uh, before he bought it. Um, I'd like to introduce you to George Dudley Seymour. This was an eccentric and very wealthy uh, attorney from New Haven. And in 1913, he came to Coventry to find Nathan Hale's house. He loved the story of Nathan Hale. He was very patriotic. And so he wanted to own the house and furnish it and restore it. So he fixed up the house and he was really interested in the history of the house. And he actually went about buying uh, different artifacts that were sold off after Deacon died. And uh, I believe he bought Nathan Hale's trunk from when he was in the army. Uh, and he bought various other um, artifacts and they're actually in the house now. Uh, when he came here, he had read a letter in his collection of many things that was written by one of Nathan Hale's nieces, Rebecca. And it said that in the North Chamber where she grew up as a girl, there was actually a profile done in pencil, a shadow portrait, if you will, of Nathan Hale. And um, so George and Lucy Moore came here. He evidently came to the chamber. He took this door off and had the door, take, took the door, had this stripped, and there is indeed a, a pencil mark of, a, of a, the profile of a young man. Now it's slightly larger than life because it would have been done to a candle, the shadow on a candle perhaps. Um, so whether or not this is Nathan Hale, it maybe doesn't matter because it caused George W. Seymour to purchase the house um, a very interesting end to the story is that George W. Seymour, here's another photograph of him, he never married or had children, but he dearly loved his horse. And um, so he often came um, by car or train, but he often rode his horse. So when the horse died, he actually had the horse buried out behind the homestead. 
He was a noble breed and made the earth rest lightly upon him. That is a statement here that's on this monument that was built for George Dudley Seymour's favorite horse. Um, the name of the horse was Tame Hooker Bones. Um, the horse was born in 1907 and died in 1937, so it was making it 30 years old. Um, the horse is said to be buried underneath this uh, rock monument, and when they buried it, they um, actually built the monument on top of it. So when you come to the homestead, you will see this. Many people say, who's buried here? George Dudley Seymour's horse. After George Dudley Seymour uh, was done restoring the place, uh, painfully restoring it, uh, he died in 1845 and then the property was given to the Antiquarian and Connecticut Landmark Society uh, who has operated ever since. I don't know how many people died here, but I can tell you that in the 18th century everybody dies at home. There aren't any hospitals, there aren't any old folks homes, so people died at home. And what they usually did was they had a wake and what that means is they would lay out the body in the parlor for a few days to see if they would wake up. Um, in the 18th century, they did not understand being in a coma or being unconscious, but they knew that sometimes dead people woke up. Except for Nathan Hale, all of the family is down in the cemetery. The Nathan Hale Cemetery is about a mile from here. Now, the stories that are already well circulated about the um, unusual activity here is that George Dudley Seymour brought guests here and they had great parties here and one time they had ridden in in a carriage and his friend got off the horse and buggy and walked up to the, win the windows to look inside and as he was peering in he saw something peering back at him through the window and as he backed off this thing disappeared and uh, it was later said to believe that it was the former owner of the house, Deacon Hale. Um, another story is that perhaps one of the servant girls... Lydia Carpenter, which has been supposedly seen sweeping the upper hallway, or she goes into the kitchen. So she has been felt and heard a number of times through the ages. The uh, guides that work here and give the tours have had a number of experiences. Um, one of them is that upon locking up the door, somebody heard somebody weeping, loudly weeping in the house. Another one is, um, we, jet, we have two guides on usually, and one was giving a tour of the house and heard somebody upstairs and thought the other guide was on a tour and said, um, is anybody, are you up there? Yes, we're up here. And after she fin finished her tour, she went out to the visitor center in the barn and said, Oh, I thought you were upstairs on the tour. She said, No, I've, I've been in here the whole time. So somebody answered back from the upstairs. So we, we don't know whose voice that was. One of the stories, experiences that happened here was to our guide, Elizabeth. She and her husband had come to a hearth cooking class. And when they were leaving and walking away from the homestead on a very dark night, they looked up at the attic window and they saw a bright light in the window and um, even her skeptical husband <laughs> admitted that he saw this bright light. Now the lights were not on in the attic and even if they were, the single light bulb is behind the chimney stack. So there's something unusual about the window here in the attic behind me. There have been the usual sounds and creaks and lights and some of those the issues are, that's an old house. <laughs> you know, things move and creak and, and settle. Another story that has been circulated is the sound of chains in the basement. And um, some people seem to think that that's Joseph, uh, Rebecca's father, who, the one who had been on the prison ship and, and came back and died of disease. So here we are, some 60 years later, the museum is open to the public so that people can learn about the Hales, the very patriotic family, and our Connecticut State hero, Nathan Hale.